afternoon to you all. I hope you are all well seated. I think um, everyone is now using the badge as uh, some sort of fan. That's very creative. So I think you all noticed that we are sitting in a theater today. And we are going to actually set up a play, a court type play. So it's going to be a trial to see and try and decipher the phenomenon in society. So we're going to talk about theater, or rather about work, labor tonight. And the idea is to be slightly provocative. We are going to talk about the right to idleness, the right to do nothing. Should we include that in the Constitution? So if you'd like to listen to this fake trial, mock trial in English, please get some headsets. And I'm now going to ask the chairman to come. Is anyone listening to the interpretation? Could you raise your hand? Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We are now going to start our hearing. Could you please stand up? You may sit down. We are sitting here tonight to answer an important question, which is the following. Should we include the right to idleness in the Constitution? Today, this question is about the future and of employment. We all hear about it. You all heard about the labor law reform. So a lot of young workers decide to move towards more in the artificial intelligence keep making progress. Some people promise that there will be men replaced by machines and robots. So we hear two viewpoints. On the one hand, Paul Lafargue, defending the right to idleness, wants to find a way for us to not be slaves of work, potentially going with universal, wages and Mr. Stakhanov, who wants to highlight the value of work, of hard work. So my question is, should we include the right to idleness, the right to doing nothing in the Constitution? So I would like for witnesses. And I would like to ask Mr. Vandenbroek, General Prosecutor, and Mr. Van der the lawyer. And we now need a jury. I will pick members of the jury at random from this hat. Hello, my name is Leo. I think the chairman of this hearing should not be picking at random the judges from this hat. Would anyone come forward and like to do it from the audience, please? People who do not have a conflict of interest and are not part of the family of any members of this hearing. You cannot be from the family of the judge. And do you all have a ticket? Number 13.
Number 34, please. Number 11. The General Attorney and Solicitor could refuse one of the members of the jury. Number 17. And number 26. Number four. Thank you so much. Now that everyone was sworn in, please pay attention, dear members of the jury. You will be the ones who will be answering yes or no at the end of this trial to the question which was asked. Please, first witness, please come to the stand. And Mr. Prosecutor, you may now interrogate your witness. Dear presiding chairman, should the witness introduce himself first? Please, would you like to state your identity and tell us why you are here with us today? Good afternoon. My name is Paolo Falco, and I work for OECD at the Employment Policies Directorate. We're working on a project on the future of work. That's why this question is very relevant to our activities. Very much a hot topic in my office. Thank you so much, dear prosecutor. You may go ahead and start asking your questions. Good afternoon, Paolo. At the Article 23 of the UN 1948 Convention shows that working is a right for human beings. Why is working a right for human beings? Well, work is not just a way to live or survive, but work is actually giving meaning to human lives. And that's why I think we should consider work and look at it beyond the economic value and see it as a universal right. And how do we defend this right? A lot of people are unemployed today. That's right. We should find the right policies, finding a balance between creating employment, having a dynamic market which allows for as much employment as possible and also promoting equality, providing everyone with the same chance to get the same access to work as much as possible, providing everyone with the same opportunities, in other words. So in your eyes, work is a way to be empowered and to create a more equal society. Absolutely. Work is a right, as we said. It is an important part of human lives. And for an equal society is a society which gives everyone an opportunity to have access to work. And at the OECD, how do you promote employment? We can look at it 
in two ways. On the one hand, we talk about creation of jobs, and on the other hand, the distribution of work, giving everyone the opportunities and access to work. So in my department, we talk about social protection. How can we give everyone the same access to work? And the first thing I am thinking about is access to education. Education is the first way to provide all citizens with the same access to a decent job, a job which will allow them to to be satisfied and live with the right conditions. We also need to take into account the social welfare dimension, the possibility to also give people to live if they don't have a job and having a right transition from one job to another. So this transition is not a right to be idle, to do nothing. No, regarding this question of idleness, I would say we are not yet reaching the level of a society where we don't need to work. We've talked about automation, robots, machines being able to do the work for us. But at the OECD, we showed that we might exaggerate the whole issue around automation, thinking that we might not have any work to do for human beings. We think it's wrong. We think the share of work which can be automated, which can be done by robots, it's not 50%. It might come up to 10% in 15 years. It wasn't a US study, it was an Oxford British study, in fact. Thank you, witness. Now, Mr. Advocate General. Good afternoon, Mr. Falco. I do like to talk about the moral value work, letting us think that we have value. For example, my colleague defending Mr. Fillon would think like you. But I would like to talk to you about figures as you work at the OECD. I'm sure you know the facts. I have a very basic question. What happened to productivity over the last 30 years? It didn't increase that much in the OECD countries. This is a relevant question because we've talked about automation issues and we can see that productivity has not been improving much. So what happened about what happened to wages? Wages didn't actually increase much. It actually decreased slightly. So that means that productivity per capita has not increased and inequalities have increased. What about inequalities over the last 30 years? We see inequalities increase. And that's related to automation and the future of employment. We can see a lot of technologies are being developed and used in the workplace and they create a major gap between the people who earn a lot and the ones who don't earn much. We see this gap increasing in the last few years. Well, that's right. There is some wealth created, though, in the middle there. Who is getting part of this wealth? Well, we think a large share is a number of people getting richer the ones who already actually own the capital rather than the ones who do the job. That's creating more inequality. That's right, but I was talking about accessibility of work. We're not saying that there won't be jobs out there or there won't be quality jobs, but we think the challenge will be giving access 
to jobs for people. Well, the jobs have not gone anywhere, right? We said there is only just little automation. The jobs have not gone anywhere. Inequalities are growing. That's true. We think it's access to work, which is uh, more and more of a challenge. We would say the OECD is very much of a left wing organization like the IMF. But there is something I used to hear. It's the trickling down theory. If wealthy people are getting richer, it's not such a matter because we get the breadcrumbs, right? You're talking about OECD, like a, a lefty or a Marxist organization. We have to say that even OECD in the last 10 to 15 years have been paying more and more attention to inequalities. So because we can see that it is morally wrong, there are issues. And on the other hand, OECD is also working to show that inequalities are damaging a country's economy. They're actually damaging the possibility to create more jobs. Inequalities create unemployment. If we take a shortcut, if there are less people who can take part in the general economy because they don't have the means, the right education, they don't have access to education, we reduce the possibility to create a job and create an employment. So the question of inequalities is relevant, not just in social discussions, but also in economic discussions. It is an issue to look at creating inequalities has a cost for society. The paradigm today, the way to think of inequalities is changing. You're allowed one more question, unfortunately. We have to hear the other three witnesses also, and we won't have enough time to speak. So what do you think about the Washington consensus? We're talking about liberalism. We hear that to promote growth, we need to decrease taxes. It could increase inequalities. Mr. De Grave, could you get to the point and ask your question? We see many different concepts in what you just said. You've mixed them all up. You talked about I think we cannot say that creating inequalities will create more growth. And when we talk about labor law, we need to make sure we don't disconnect the labor law from the concept of social security. And we don't want to deregulate the market, but maybe we need to deregulate and provide social security. This is a Danish model. This is the Scandinavian model. The fact that the market is more flexible, but more secure for people for people who, who are going, for example, through a transition, through a vulnerable period and need social security. Thank you very much. I can see the prosecutor needs now to interrogate our second witness. Please come to the stand. Could you please tell us your identity and tell us your position. My name is Jean-Laurent Cassidy. I am a journalist for Slate.fr. I wrote a book published 
one month ago. It is talk. Uh, it is about the young graduate exodus, trying to move towards more fulfilling jobs, like small retail jobs and craftsmanship. And uh, that's that's why I am here to testify. Thank you. So the first question is quite an obvious question. Why are these young professionals leaving a secure job for a more precarious position? First, these people usually feel disconnected, disconnected from the real economy, looking at executive senior executive positions. These positions have been diluted in the marketplace in a much more administrative position. And the digital transition, which is supposed to free up the workers, is also adding a number of filters between the workers and the reality of work. And so the executives working in open spaces, they spend a lot of time working on PowerPoints, nobody reads. They spend a lot of time doing administrative tasks. They are disconnected from the real life and they get bored. But that's not the only problem. They feel it's meaningless at the end of the day. They feel like their work is not useful for a society. That's why often they look into moving to a different job, a different career. They are much more worried about keeping this job than unemployment. So these professionals, I think, are also used to be be possibly the best in their masters, in their school, as you know, these graduates, we heard in big cities, may have difficulties in finding a job. They don't feel privileged, although they have studied for many years. And so the benefits that you get when you work as a senior executive are not sufficient, are not relevant to these people. They don't feel like this is a win-win situation. So what kind of jobs do they go for now? Often they want to open their own company so they can work in a small size company. These companies often have a close link with the neighborhood livelihood. So typically it could be a restaurant, a food truck, a brasserie or they could open an artist's hall or bakery. So you would see different profiles of people who've studied in business schools and end up working in a bakery, patisserie. So we see more and more people doing that. And they also generally go for almost manual jobs, jobs where they work with uh, raw commodities or do manual work. Others will find much more value in working with local stakeholders, supporting uh, also uh, care activities, for example. Uh, there are yoga teachers who used to be consultants. You have just one question left. So why would they choose to go for these jobs and to change their lifestyle? They could just stop working, they have money enough, they could enjoy themselves and it would be enough. I, I think they, they don't have money enough to spend the rest of their life not working anymore, so they need to find a job. It is maybe more related to uh, personal development. They want to be fulfilled elsewhere uh, by doing something else than their previous jobs. Usually they they want to feel useful and they want to go back to the society to feel useful again and to help the rest of the world. 
I believe that they want to, if you, if you want, um, to create something. And this is their motivation. It's uh, the new sector of uh, personal development nowadays. I thank you. Now you may ask your questions to the witness. So I imagine you've met a lot of these uh, former workers that go for craftsman shift or they become bakers, etc. So I don't want to have specific cases, but I quote when you said uh, going from uh, high school to become a plumber, you know, it is, well, anyway, last time I called a plumber, it was, uh, yeah, of course, it's off topic. Uh, I know, I know. It is off topic, but still, uh, this uh, fact of being declassified, if you want, of falling some steps on the social ladder. So why that? Well, I do not believe it is about losing something because jobs, uh, position, job, uh, sorry, manager positions in big companies have lost their prestige, if you want, and new, uh, the new careers they are finding now, it is completely different for them. So imagine for a young, uh, a young worker that was uh, 18 in 2008, becoming a digital manager, it's not something that makes them dream so more. On the contrary, becoming a little baker, working uh, with uh, the heart, it is something very different. So I believe they would have more, much more experiences to share. That would be, they would feel more interesting if they need to speak to an audience. Of course, it is uh, more fun indeed to put up uh, cupcake pictures on Instagram. I imagine. So, but still, we're talking about sacrifices. Uh, imagine if I was to tell my parents years ago, I want to become a butcher. Uh, they would have been really disappointed. Indeed, um, to go for um, short trainings, and um, it, it is not so glamorous, indeed, comparing to classic uh, university. Uh, diplomas, etc. It is different, but uh, it, it combines two um, different abilities, cognitive abilities, for instance, and practical uh, skills. So it is about using uh, the practical senses. It was uh, badly considered a few years ago, but now it's been completely uh, redeveloped in a different way. So uh, this should be your last question. Yes, indeed, I have always known you were extremely careful when, while checking on time. So among these last people, the people you've met, were they hinting on some? Where did, did you feel they were pessimistic or they were criticizing something? Yes, in a sense, I, I felt they were saying it is a way for a lot of people to escape their current situation, and it is about um, making a new values evolve. And the importance is to rethink the whole market value, the whole market system. So we need to address new uh, desires from the consumers in a different, completely different way. So it is about giving about ourselves, uh, having an important role. And this is not what capitalism was about until now. So thank you for your contributions. Now this is time for our third witness. Once again, please, will you introduce yourself and explain to us why you are here today? So, 
Good afternoon. I am Inedi Drissi. I've uh, built a startup. Uh, it is for new independent people that left uh, the, their salary job. So they're unfortunately facing uh, worse conditions in regards to uh, social rights, protections, etc. So our association is about protecting them. We're trying to have to come up with a mutual fund uh, to protect to protect them, to offer them uh, legal services, to protect them when they want to find an accommodation, etc. And I had this idea because it happened to me. I was working, I was employed, and I decided to quit my job. Okay, thank you. Now it is time for your questions. You said, ooh la la, and in fact, why? Uh, do you think other people want to start working uh, independently to be uh, independent workers? Uh, at the moment, it is a large percentage of the population that has chosen to um, go for uh, freelancing, for instance. Because at the moment, a lot of companies want to find accessibility. And this is what the previous witness said. Uh, a lot of people, they want to be to feel uh, differently about their jobs. They want to be fulfilled at the human level as well. So they want an interesting way of doing so. So being independent uh, can be extremely interesting for them. So what are they choosing then? We see a lot of uh, different profiles, like uh, someone who is self-employed, developing a specific sector, so still in the same field. Another one could be a consultant previously and then deciding to be um, a yoga teacher because they would say, oh, I've always dreamed about becoming a yoga teacher. So then this person will be able to create uh, their business and offer new services. OK, I see. But what do they value the most in this new lifestyle? And what are the disadvantages? What, what is sure is we won't see people that will let this, their salaried work for nothing. Uh, and in fact, this is a more stressful life to be self-employed because your wages are not regular. It is more stressful. So self-employed people might face difficulties, of course, but they won't complain as much as if they were still employed in their previous company. So they're trying to continue on the day-to-day -day basis, and that's all. So Mr. Degrave, this is your turn to ask questions to our witnesses, but please be short. Do you think that France should be a start nation? And what does it mean to be a started nation? Well, I'm asking you the question. Well, it's nobody knows. It is an, like an empty box. So, OK, let me put it like that. Let's imagine that everyone, anybody could become self-employed and would deal with their job and life themselves. Do you think this could be an ideal way of working in society? Well, it is a double question. So first one, are all people uh, suited to work as a freelancer? I'm not sure, because when we're talking about being self-employed, you can be self-employed because it is your choice, or you can be self-employed because you're suffering from, uh, you've been fired from your previous work, for instance. So we have these people, the last ones, that are suffering because they didn't want, uh, they didn't intend first to become self-employed, so they will suffer from this new, this new way of working. Uh, 
when we say we will try to get rid of our employees by deregulating, um, etc. This is not the good solution because I can imagine for my case, uh, if I had been fired, it would have been much more complicated and difficult for me. OK, but let's mention statuses. What are the social backgrounds of these people, their trainings, etc. What are they doing? Well, it is really uh, mixed because we have uh, the younger generation arriving on the marketplace. It is one out of 10 that want to become self-employed, but uh, it is a larger number for young people. Because these young people, they have been uh, raised, if you want, by the internet, by new means of, means of communication, etc. So the new ways of receiving education have changed. So they're discovering a new business model. They're acquiring new skills over the internet. So let's say they've not been programmed, if you want, like where their uh, elders. So now concerning the status, imagine, let's imagine a worker that has um, valuable education, etc. So why would these freelancer, uh, how could he, them justify they would ask for, let's say, 4,000 4, euros per day for their specifically um, skills and well there is something that is not well known is when you are employed when you are self-employed sorry you can uh, ask for an early wage etc well i'm i know it myself I, i'm an attorney so yeah, so let's go back to employ uh, people that are employed, they are usually working through a um, long-term contract. So it is not about the time they spend at work. It is about the task, if you want. But on the contrary, for self-employed people, they're, they're paid for a specific task. And when they're not working, they can work on their personal branding they can work on their new skills, acquiring new skills, etc. So let's say that in that game, in that freelancing game, people who win are those who es escape from standardization of the workplace. You see, you have two types of uh, freelancers. You have the one that will offer the same services as everyone else, and the others that will be innovative. They can adapt themselves to the specific time, and then uh, the client will say, oh, I prefer them because they are unique. They're not offering a standard, a standard uh, set of competencies. So do you mean? Well, this is this should be your last question now. So do you mean this is something they've acquired by working on themselves, on their new skills? Indeed, it is not the same way of working. Because a freelancer is offering an extremely personalized service. So it's absolutely not a normative task. So I was mentioning before the work you do because it is a choice and the one you do because you have to. So in this system, freelancers are able to offer something extremely unique. But you know, if we were to say, to tell people, okay, let's do it, uh, you have to quit your job. Merch, and now fourth and last witness. So. Please, will you tell us who you are and why you are here today? Yes, dear Mr. Judge, Attorney, and General Attorney, I see there is a large diversity in this trial and among the juries. I'm Nicola Metilizic. I uh, teach 
politic, uh, policy sciences. I'm politologist. I work for NGO, which is a without border library. So we're trying to give means to people to access culture and education. If I'm here today, it is because during the pre presidential campaign, I was a coordinator for Benoit Hamon. And f work was for him at the core of uh, his, uh, his questioning. We've tried to offer new points of views, new alternatives. And I'm, I'm happy to be here today because uh, the pre presidential campaign wasn't the ideal place for us to express our ideas. So first question for you, we are talking about the uh, minimal wage, the universal minimal wage. So who would be the ideal candidates? Who wants this uh, universal wage? That is a good question. The member from the OECD talked about the specific study that uh, uh, Oxford studies and all the studies that, in, that were done in the US said that the workplace could be a cause of stress for people. So it would be a good idea to rethink the whole uh, topic and to wonder whether a, a universal wage could be a good solution. So, uh, do you do you think that some people would need such uh, a new solution or? or just a few amount of people. The thing is, being ahead of your time is extremely difficult. So we are not sure if a lot of people would really want it right now. It would, it would be part of a set of a new rights. But if we look, uh, like we said uh, previously on the the work you have to produce, we see that unfortunately there is a large number of employees that do not feel well on the workplace. It is linked to this question of sharing the time at work, and a lot of studies have shown that. We see that transformations in the in society are urging us to rethink the whole topic. So unfortunately, at the moment, we're doing short term, we're having a short term reflection. So we need to come up with longer term solutions. So you were mentioning neoliberalism uh, theories. It is interesting. However, I what I think is we need to improve our thinking, and this is how a good uh, universal wage could be created. So how, which form, uh, which form could it take considering the rarefaction of uh, jobs? Well, the thing is, um, employment will be completely uh, changed because of automatization, for instance. Uh, this will free a lot of time for workers. <laughs> oh, sorry, there is a really funny drawing now that's been made of me. You should carry on. Sorry, I lost my. Uh, I lost what I wanted to say. 
I think this question of work should be uh, put together in the whole idea of fighting uh, of a class, classes fight, if you want. So we're talking about poor people, a poor class. And the minimum income shouldn't be seen at the, the end of the work at all. It should be seen as another way of helping people. And this is what I believe Marx said a long time ago. So, Mr. De Grave, your questions? So, we mentioned the minimum wage. I think it was part of Benoit Hamon's program. It was quite interesting. But it was a question of a robot text. So, could you tell us what it is about? I believe this program was really coherent. Well, I always need to work on myself, so it is good for me to find new arguments. So, since, let's say, uh, the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, we have this uh, phenomenon, industrialization, that completely transformed society and the workplace. So we see uh, this in the class struggle, but in a different way. Uh, we see journalists that are target as well at the moment. We see also with the blockchains, uh, new, uh, the jobs like uh, lawyers, etc. These positions will be completely transformed. And not mentioning the uh, increased use of uh, robots, technique, etc. So we have robots that create. But there is no tax on this. So in order to protect the work, we should create a specific fund in order to re-inject the benefits of the work. And are you, so you agree with what Paulo said before? Indeed. So let's go back to this uh, universal minimum wage. Do you think this would, imagine if you give uh, 500, 1,000 euros to someone, do you believe that people would still go to work if they could just have the money and smoke weed? Well, because we have the same uh, hobbies, apparently. Well, apparently, according to studies, this wouldn't be the case. We are talking about a new way of working, a chosen work. So at the moment, it is impossible to be involved in uh, an association or to read poetry uh, in retired homes, etc. So at the moment, it is impossible. But the interesting thing with the uh, universal minimum wage would be that an employee could have this free time to develop their skills, etc. What do you think about obsession concerning uh, the bad unemployed people? It's like a cancer eating society, etc. Well, I think that with work we're touching in a uh, we're touching a quite religious topic. So it is about encouraging people being more lazy, if you want. We want that if we try to limit uh, work, and on the contrary, or in parallel, if you want, if we develop more hobbies, mm, we have more leisure time to be invested in society, etc., this is very good. So it means we don't have to work uh, 12 hours a day to feel that we exist, that we are useful for society. And 
this is what was said during the uh, presidential campaign, even if it was a really short campaign. But we said it. So I believe things will happen and things will change. Last questions concerning this ability to stay in idleness. Do you think this is a condition for generalization of the work that is chosen and not uh, felt as a burden? Well, I'm not sure I would put it like that, but I am sure that the world is becoming more and more a cause of anxiety. So there is this need of creating among people. They want to still be able to be free as butterflies, to create, to imagine. So we don't have to suffer. We don't have to do something that potentially can destroy you, you know, because there have been a lot of studies being made in that uh, sense. So it is uh, very interesting to free people from work. And I believe that the uh, universal minimum wage would allow that. Thank you very much. Thank you, witnesses, etc. So now, First, we would like to hear from the prosecutor, then from the attorney. First, Mr. Prosecutor, would you please tell us your views on this topic? I think five minutes will be enough for my indictment. All was said. so. They've told us how work throughout history freed the human being, why it is one of the main goals at the political level. Then secondly, we had another witness that said that this uh, form of way of regarding our uh, looking at work is fading away, but we have to invent a new one. And we have people that do not necessarily want to leave their jobs, but they want to find a meaning. Then third witness that told her this story of self-employed people that are leaving their secure and safe work in order to be able to express themselves freely and to develop this sense of uniqueness. Uniqueness, which is the best tool against robots. Because today the question is not about how could the robots work for us, but the question is how can we work alongside with robots and still be able to create. And then the fourth witness that said that the uh, universal minimum wage is not a solution that should be implemented uh, with no work at all. It should be a new solution to allow people to work and still being able to have more free time for themselves. So this right should appear in the Constitution. But what are we being told, in fact? Uh, it is about staying quiet, chilling, enjoying yourself, being lazy, falling asleep. And then it means also, let us do, because we are the experts, we are the uh, voluntary workers, imaginary voluntary workers. We will do this for you, and we will be in charge. So this is all illusions if we imagine that for just one second, the world will stop its natural course. And be careful, because if you take that nap, you might uh, find a completely different world when you wake up. A world in which you have no, no place anymore. And then, when that moment comes, you will only be entitled to choose maybe which channel on TV you want to look at, to watch. So 
Also, if we're talking about right to uh, idleness and right to work, is it something that is really coherent? Can you have the two such two different rights together at the same time? So we can wonder, will the right to work will still be a right when the idleness, the right to idleness will be implemented? Or will we erase the right to work from constitution? As you've well understood, this is not my opinion. And last but not least, what is it about this uh, fever to create new laws? What is the impulse behind that? Why does the government want to um, want to um, want to change constitution, etc.? And before you hear today, I'm really humble. And I, I enjoy my right and my time to have a good beer. And I'm clever enough not to mix right with uh, what is common sense. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear prosecutor. Dear Advocate General, you also have five mi minutes. Please make your plea. Dear presiding judge, because Mr. Van de Broek, as a priest, I hear him talking like Macron and making all job seekers go away. But we're not here putting work on trial, but the right to work is on trial. Dear ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Dear presiding judge, you did your job very well, thank you. I would like to start off with a joke. We all have a right to work and the right to find a job. It sounds like dark humor. This is the start of the 1946, the preamble of the 1946 constitution. You have the right to get a job. Well, what, do, what level do we reach? 10% unemployment in France? 25% for 18 to 25 year olds? But it is a right for everyone. Well, if I may say so, who cares? You have the right to find a job. Well, having a right to find a job and a duty to find a job Today is 2017. I think we should review this constitution article and put it in the bin and talk about the right to idleness, to doing nothing. I think today you have in your hands the power to put the right to idleness in the constitution. Because we heard the different witnesses and their points of view and what did they say? They said it's a good thing to be able to work, but if you feel like a slave, doing your work every day, this is not a benefit anymore. So work would disappear whether we want it or not. Looking at unemployment figures, it keeps increasing. So we either probably should ignore, be really ignorant to think that today unemployment is due to a labor law, labor code being too rigid. We've been trying to get the reforms, and today, remember, it is the 10 year anniversary of the subprimes crisis. And do not tell me about Germany. We all talk about flexibility. I am not talking about OECD here, sorry, Stefano, but Macron would wanting to decrease unemployment developing the part-time work, creating precarious jobs. What really matters is the number of hours really worked, people have really worked for. And this, unfortunately, is becoming more and more precarious because of artificial intelligence and automation. So we're hoping that we could find jobs for everyone in the current context. 
We have stopped counting the university studies and academic studies, telling us that we will be able to see the unemployment figures decrease. So we're talking about 47% of potentially automated jobs in 20 years. How are we going to create more employment this way? So we will see soon the traders and maybe tomorrow the doctors being replaced by robots. We will see changes in demographic, changes in anthropology. This is right within our scope and in one century I think the next generations will make fun of us. I think they will laugh at us thinking that we put up with the type of work we have to face to today. We are not capable to actually find a society which can fit the conditions, the technology and the new work conditions. So all the countries in OECD show that inequalities are increasing. The wealth of the 10 most wealthy families have increased by 35% just last year. So all the ones who say they're just living on benefits should also talk about the gaps and inequalities and the wealthy becoming wealthier. And we see the productivity of work keeps growing and wages are stable, stagnant. But what does that mean? It means you have been robbed. That means Lilian and Bolloré have been getting richer while other people have just kept stable wages and the cost of life increasing. So we don't want to fight here, but basically you're giving the wealthier more wealth. And I think it's time to try and change this virtual circle into a virtual circle. So in the 21st century, we will be idle or we will not be. We were saying earlier, that some people think they have bullshit jobs. It's because they know that they have jobs which are not useful for society. So you are right. And you should go and protest. So I am asking you today, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please put the right to idleness to doing nothing in the Constitution. We don't want to spend our days binge watching TV shows while doing nothing. The right to being idle is not an end in itself. Being bored is actually the start of human activities. To be creative, we need to have this luxury of doing nothing for a while. When people are continuous development, to be creative and to find the next idea, you need to be trained and you need time to be bored, to be idle. Actually, everybody used to know that. The Greeks, the Romans, they knew that idleness is the starting point of any creative process. And Nietzsche did say that boredom is the time when the soul is quiet before it goes on a happy and joyous run. So we have to put up with boredom to see the effects of creativity. So that's why trying to take boredom away is just as vulgar as working without taking any pleasure. Today, we're constantly stimulated. Our attention is constantly being attracted to these and these places. So I think we should not listen to Mr. Advocate General Vandenberg, because I think probably under his robe, he's just wearing a swimsuit. And I'm sure he's going to run away in his convertible and drive to the Côte d'Azur. So please, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let our children and grandchildren not face the slavery of work that we're living today. I think we've had enough.
Thank you, Mr. Van de Broek, Mr. de Grave. This is now time to hear the members of the jury delivering their opinion. We are all going outside and actually find out. As you heard earlier, Duzbek and Rika have developed this play. We usually work on it at MK2, the library. We always find a way to talk about current affairs. Thank you, Coco, who's been uh, drawing very beautiful pictures of us. I didn't see what she would do as a caricature. Only Nicola made the mistake of looking on the screen at what was happening in the meantime. So you can see Coco's drawings in Charlie Hebdo, the newspaper, every week. So I don't know if this is the first time that you see a TGF play. We have a lot of fun preparing it. It's more fun than a conference or speech in a conference. How did you feel it was your first? I think I'm confident. What would you have answered now? Do you think we should have written the right to idleness, including it in the Constitution? The fun thing, what we find is fun in this type of play, in this type of setting, is that we can talk about current affairs and hear many different opinions. So we heard uh, Nicola, Paolo, they talked about automation, policies, what we could include. <laughs> With uh, Ind and Jean Laurent, we had different answers. We had provocative ideas on the right to idleness. First, talk about employment and long term employment. Is it going to disappear? Is entrepreneurship going to grow? And last thing we heard right-wing opinions talking about the value of work and we talk about the moral values so a bit of a left-wing and a right-wing debate in in the jury we heard three men and one lady. We originally wanted 50-50, uh, but uh, one person had to cancel, and that's why. So of course, during We Share Fest, we do everything to make sure that we have equal numbers of ladies and gentlemen. So here, we didn't quite meet the requirements, but it was a last minute thing. They don't usually take this long um, in coming together, the members of the jury. Do you have comment, remarks? Antoine, it's uh, actually your kid, your son. What would you say if he told you he wants to become a butcher? Well, we don't eat that much meat, so I doubt that would be his first idea. <laughs> Poor thing.
So the jury, is the jury done with their deliberation? Please, come over. Over here, please. You're too close to me. So yes, this is the order we agreed on. So first, member of the jury, do you think we should include the right to idleness in the Constitution? In my opinion, yes, we should. The main reason is because the right to work is included in the Constitution, but it is an abstract concept. So I think idleness should also be included as an abstract concept. Thank you. What about you, Ms? Should we include the right to idleness in the Constitution? My answer is no. I think we should redefine what redefine what work is in the 21st century. Thank you. Third member of the jury. <laughs> yes, I would say we need to include the right to idleness in the constitution to allow everyone, not just the people who can choose what job they want to do, to make sure everyone can have access to this right. Thank you. What about you, Ms? So far, we have two yeses and one no. I also would like to say no. We should not include the right to idleness in the Constitution, because I think finding a job and finding a job we like should be a choice. Being idle would be a personal choice, and I don't think we should include both concepts in the Constitution. We have two in favor and two against. You now have the large responsibility of telling us whether the right to idleness will be included in the Constitution. So tell us, what is your opinion? My answer to this question is yes. I don't believe that we should take uh, slavery at work as a definitive concept. And I think we should also be able to be idle to make sure we let all our creative juices flow. And so you have won. All those in favor have voted, and the right to idleness will be included in the Constitution. Thank you for your